Hello and welcome to Mining Network. We're joined again by Christopher Eccleston, Principal over at Hallgarten Company and expert in all things specialty metals. Christopher, thanks for coming back onto the programme. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, today we are talking about rare earths. Um, set the scene to start with, what's the landscape looking like and what are the main uses and really what, what's the current feel in the market in the rare earth space? Okay, um, well to, to set the big picture is that we're we're in rare earth boom uh, mark two. Uh, first rare earth boom was um, 2010 to 2012 when uh, panic uh, affected the hen house and um, the, uh, there was much flapping of wings over a Chinese domination of the rare earth space. And here we are uh, 10 years later and <laughs> we're back flapping the wings again that um, China dominates the rare earth space. And, Despite everything that happened um, in the interim, including the vast flourishing of up to 300 listed rare earth companies in the first boom, um, only less than a handful of companies have actually got to production. And only one, um, well, two, I guess, if you, if you re uh, regard the rebirth of uh, MP um, out of the ruins of uh, Mollycorp, and then you have Linus, which was created in the first boom um, and is still with us and uh, seemingly flourishing at the moment. Um, so, you know, not much came out of the first boom except a lot of hot air. Um, and here we are. Uh, we've got a second boom going on, a uh, lot less players this time um, because uh, there are investors out there that remember they were burnt in the first go round. And so they're not going back with the names that were around then. And most of those names have actually vaporized. I'd say out of the 300, um, by like a year and a half ago, um, there were less than 20 left. Um, so that's pretty brutal um, Darwinian attrition. Um, and out of those, you know, as I said, less than a handful had actually got to production, more like three. Um, so not much. And so here we are again, uh, but there's some differences this time around, but I'll get to those a bit later. First, we need to um, say what is actually driving this. You know, the rare earth um, suite is actually the lanthanide series of the periodic table, uh, which contains, I think, uh, 11, <laughs> 11 elements, uh, but most of them are sort of irrelevant. There are, there are six or seven that are relevant. Um, and uh, a few of them uh, link to the... Um, the EV revolution, as it's called. Um, back in, um, of course, the, the previous boom, um, the EV revolution was a bit of a twinkle in the eye. And uh, then the main focus was on the fact that uh, they were used for uh, green applications like uh, wind, turbine, wind turbines, where um, uh, some of the wind turbines um, included up to a, a ton of magnets, uh, rare earth magnets in them. And so um, they were they were big users of, of rare earths at that time. There were and there are a myriad of other applications because rare earths have long been um, uh, you know niche things in uh, exotic stuff like um, night vision goggles. Um, uh, they provided the red in your color TV sets um, after they were invented in the nineteen sixties. Lots of lasers and things that they were used in magnets. Beyond those magnets, there they were used in things like buckyballs. Um, they they were made out of uh, rare earth magnets. So um, lots of exotic uses, uh, but not very big. And it became very niche. Uh, the whole Western, uh, you know, interest in rare earths faded uh, several decades ago. The Chinese moved into the space because they had a few big mines, and they um, essentially cleaned up but they provided everyone with the product at really cheap prices. So um, they undercut um, any possibility that um, a rare earth projects outside China would uh, get going again. And when prices went up back in the 2010-12 um, period, um, suddenly um, companies in the West said, we can do this too and we can make money. And the Chinese, of course, at the time were also restricting um, access to rare earths to, to people that they wanted to um, selectively punish, like the Japanese, um, who were uh, the biggest um, sort of on processes of, uh, of rare earths that were exported from China. So um, 
that's what that's what's driven it. Um, so now, really, in this second boom, um, it's less a case of uh, focusing on the wind turbines, and it's more focusing on the use of the magnets in the engines of uh, EVs. Um, and obviously, EVs have come from being a bit of a twinkle in the eye ten years ago to being uh, a, a bit of a fad in the middle of the decade when um, you know uh, hybrids suddenly started to appear in the driveways of one percenters, um, and now they're making a case that uh, we're all going to be driving EVs. Um, though I suspect the way things are going that. Uh, only the one percent, or maybe the ten percent, will actually have a car, and everybody else will have to ride their donkey. Um, yeah. So uh, that's what the outlook is, and so that's created a lot of excitement. You know, so the type of excitement you get on the on the battery side um, from the lithium is also being reflected on the um, on the engine side end of the car, <laughs> both at different ends. I don't know if they are. Um, and uh, so people are excited about the possibilities of a really serious surge in demand for the battery, uh, for the um, magnets, sorry, for the, uh, for the engines of the EVs. And um, beyond that, though, um, you know, 10 years ago, people were worried about China, uh, you know, some sort of like subliminal feeling that something was wrong about being dependent upon China. Now, 10 years on, People are sure that there's something wrong about being dependent upon China because China has really sort of started to show a more a bit of a more malevolent, um, predatory and aggressive um, stance on a whole lot of things. Um, and uh, people are saying we cannot be dependent upon China, even if we're going to have to pay more to get products that are sourced elsewhere. And that's really what's driving this. And particularly in the US, there is now an obsession with um, with resource security and um, magnets, um, rare earths are seen as, as the prime uh, vehicle by which China can sort of like wave a big stick at the US um, in the resources field. So there's a bit of a scramble on to find um, alternative sources and uh, the US has sort of realised that it doesn't have too many alternative sources. Even in the, the last boom, there were hardly any uh, rare earth projects being mooted within the US. Uh, just, most of them were in Canada, some in Africa, some in Europe. So, um, you know. I just that. yeah, I just want to I just want to butt in there because it's yeah. Obviously, we're talking about this dependence on China, and yeah, you look at what's happening this week with the COP conference and or the summit, and um, basically most Western countries now are signing up to this idea of cutting down carbon emissions at certain dates, and it becoming a bit of a game with each other as to who can pull out the, the best guarantees without actually guaranteeing anything, I guess. But really, um, obviously, w- one of the main problems with rare earths that we're starting to see or what we have seen in a long time is that to process them, it's very, very unenvironmentally friendly. Um, if, if the US don't want a dependence, and not even just the US, but also there have been talks of through companies like Pensana potentially having a processing facility in the UK, uh, and there have been other talks in Europe as well. How, how can European and or Western countries realistically start producing rare earths and not have this dependence on China when they're signing up to all of these environmental agreements that are really going to tie their hands behind their back? Yeah, no, it's a big problem. Um, the one, one of the, there's a deeper problem here that uh, it's just beyond the actual processing techniques. Because, you know, the Chinese um, back pre-2010 had... Um, a lot of bad press on the issue of their processing of ionic uh, absorption clay deposits, which was their sort of like specialty. Um, and the use of acid, uh, you know, deforestation, environmental devastation, and these acids ending up um, getting in, into rivers and the environment. So it was pretty damaging. I mean, the Chinese have cleaned up their act on a lot of those things at the moment. The, the problem, the bigger problem with actually the rare earth space is not that the processing is um, is environmentally damaging, it's that um, so many rare earth mineralizations include uranium and thorium. And um, uh, while uranium is useful um, and um, energy fuels in the US has uh, come up with a scheme to process um, um, monazite there um, that's actually sourced from within the US um, and it's, it's used for other purposes, as the primary, as the 
they take the leftovers, um, the tailings essentially, and they're reprocessing them, taking out the uranium, then sending it to uh, Silmet, which is a um, processing facility in Estonia. Um, and uh, they're, they're processing it there. So it's, it's all pretty clean process there. But many of the other rare earth deposits around the world do have um, high um, uranium and thorium uh, aspects to them. And thorium is actually, despite the fact that it's, it's a more, you know, it's a benign radioactive element, um, is a bigger problem because there are so few usages for thorium now that when you take it out, you can't send it off to a nuclear power plant to, to fire the power plant as you can with uranium. You just essentially got to stockpile it and hope that sometime in the next decade, next few decades, someone will come up with some use for it because otherwise um, there are big piles of thorium. And, you know, in fact, the French used to be the leaders in processing uh, rare earths um, at uh, a big refinery that's at La Rochelle. And they've effectively refused to take any uh, more rare earth materials that have even the vaguest um, sign of radioactivity about them because they have gigantic stockpiles of thorium and they cannot take any more. And so that has created quite, you know, quite, a, quite a dilemma there because many of these mineralizations do have the radioactive aspect. And if you're going to process them anywhere in high density um, uh, populated zones, um, you've got the risk that there's going to be, um, you know, complaints. But even beyond that, if we take a look at the, you know, the project that I do like, which is the energy fuels one, they're transporting all that comes from, I think, Georgia or Alabama all the way to Colorado. Okay, not too far. Then they're taking the processed material from there all the way to Estonia. And then presumably they're bringing it back to the U.S. <laughs> because it's supposed to be making the U.S., independent of Chinese um, production. What is the carbon footprint of this kilo of, uh, of rare earths making this transition across this enormous, enormous distance before it actually comes back in the form of something that you could even start to be, turn into a magnet? Um, it's really amazing. Um, and so the carbon footprint of rare earths is pretty bad. And the radioactive footprint is very bad. And maybe the acid um, leakage into uh, water systems is far reduced from what it was, or even deep eliminated. But these other two aspects are, are now way worse. And they're like a new, um, uh, a new twist on all this. Because many of these mines um, that are being uh, looted are in Africa, um, ones in southern Chile, um, you, you've got these far distant um, uh, chains, even when you're producing out of the southeast US, um, there's, uh, there's a horrible footprint for, for rare earths, I've got to say. Yeah, it's, it's a funny one because obviously most of these are being used in magnets that, like you said, for wind energy or EVs, which are meant to have a different narrative, which are around obviously clean energy, but everything so, that we, and this is obviously a, a massive talking point in the industry at the moment, even with other metals, that yep. the amount of carbon that we, that we potentially may be releasing just to sort of ramp up so this carbon neutral is, is, is going to be a bit more impactful than, than if we carried yep. on course. Mo moving on, the sticks of rare earths though, moving on to the sort of supply and demand side of this market. Like you were saying, most of this is produced in China. It's mainly mined in China. It is a strategic metal, especially in defense as well. It has been sort of mentioned. Yes. It's, um, it's vital in that area, which is obviously why we need to get the dependents away. Yes. At the moment, what is the current, um, I guess, percentages of um, supply and demand for these metals, including China as well, please? You know, more than 80% of the global supply is still coming out of China. And there are no projects out there that are really big enough to, to make big dents in that. Um, Mountain Pass, um, MP Materials uh, Mine in California is currently sending concentrates, and this is another example, from California all the way to China where they're processed in China and then come back to the US um, for a sale into, you know, whatever consumption they, they, they have in the US. Um, so you've got these really long chains. And, um, but MP are proposing to, you know, go into downstream processing so that won't happen so the the product that they mine 
will actually get processed all the way to Nelly magnets and maybe they're claiming even they'll get into the magnet business themselves and um, they'll be able to um, sell that into the US market. But most of the other projects are in distant places and, um, you know, they have this, they have this curious, um, you know, uh, contradiction that they're supposedly making us greener, but they're not. <laughs> and then with the demand side, what's the forecast at the moment in terms of how much more rare earths we're, we're really going to need over the next uh, few years? Know, that, that's where you, you, the rare earths is a big sweeping term because we have all these different rare earths. And the unfortunate reality is that to process the lanthanide sweep of, uh, of, of rare earths, you have to first take out the cerium. And the reality is that in the whole 10 years since the first boom, there have been no more applications for cerium, which is mainly used in the ceramic industry and always has been. So um, unless ceramic industry is going to make a, a gigantic step forward, um, that most heavyweight rare earth is not going to be um, seeing any further consumption. Lanthanum, for instance, which is the second biggest one, is used in... Um, in a, a petroleum cracking, uh, which of course is a bit of a sunset industry, if you believe that we're all moving to EVs. So there's going to be less demand for that. And then you've all, it's also used as a lubricant. Um, so, and then you get down to the smaller percentages where, you know, rarer deposit may have in its production 40% plus cerium, 17% lanthanum, you're down then to 5%, 6% neodymium. And, um, and the other mephrasidemium and the, the, the smaller rare earths, you've got to process the whole 100% to get out the, the few percent that you really want for the ones that are going into the magnet industry. So um, admittedly, the demand for the presidemium, the neodymium is going to soar, and for um, dysprosium, terbium, also useful in um, cell phones and things like that. The, the, the vibrator in your cell phone is actually terbium magnet. But the, um, the problem is, uh, you know, what do you do with the rest of the stuff that no one wants? People are talking about, um, uh, you know, stockpiling cerium. I mean, how big a stockpile do you want? And then eventually the price collapses for cerium. Um, it's going to endanger the economics uh, of so much of the rest of the operation. Well, and so many of the projects from 2012 ultimately fell down on the basis that, you um, the prices for um, cerium and lanthanum were very elevated back then, and they made things that were untenable look economic. This time round, cerium and lanthanum have not moved, uh, and they're lying there like a fish dead on the dock. <laughs> surely, surely, if if you're having to process a lot more material now, that which by the sounds of it isn't economic because it's not used in the same applications yeah. that it was just to get the small you know, four or five percent of the rare earths that we're talking about we, we must be looking at a huge increase in price uh, yeah. because obviously the costs of or, or yeah. the sell-on costs of Absolutely. of all of this is massively going to increase it, it, yeah the price of the neodymium price of neodymium have to rise enormously to cover the fact that you're going to be making less out of the cerium and possibly out of the lanthanum yeah because um, you're going to be having so much more of it um mass is more of it with no extra demand means essentially that, that you know that that part of the the equation is going to remain stable to collapse it. Um, so it's uh, something that's rarely talked about. You know, people focus in on the the individual metals as if you can pick them out and you can uh, you can do something with them irrespective of the rest. You cannot. Um, you've got to take the you know the the good, bad, and the ugly when it comes to uh, the lanthanide series. So really, for for this industry become or stay economical for the miners um the price is going to need to drastically hike up um is well, there subsidies you know the, the, right. many of the companies in the u.s or who are claiming to want to be in the industry in the u.s are rattling their begging bowl and um some of them are rattling it rather more softly in the eu but um they're going to be needing to rattle it there as well because um and, you know, some of these projects are being mooted in the UK. Um, you know, they're essentially going to the Department of International Trade and saying, uh, we need money, um, give us some subsidies or else we're not going to put our plant in the UK. And so there's this whole sort of like um, uh, beggar thy neighbour thing going on. Um, but politicians also don't want to see that they've given $100 million to a project and it's never built. 
because that's pretty fatal at the uh, at the ballot box. And you know there were a lot of fakers in the rare earth space back in 2010 to 12. Um, if the pity helped the the minister who gives 100 million to a company to build a processing plant and they don't build it um, and they spend it on you know trips or, or themselves or whatever. Um, uh, you know that's gonna there's gonna be a backlash if people say where's our money gone, where is our in, uh, resource security, where is the factory. And if they can't see it and it's not there, um, they're going to say we were scammed. And what about for investors, sort of retail investors or anyone else who invested into, say, mining companies? You're talking about there were a lot of pretenders in the past that people would have lost a lot of money on. What's yeah. the any advice on how to potentially pick a, a, a rare earth company? What are the main things yeah, people should I be think, looking I out think for? The, the key secret here is to look at the, the whole um, uh, soup to nuts, as it said, in the US. Um, you know, the, a company that's got itself set up that it's, okay, it might have the mine. The mine is the least profitable part of the equation. The more profitable part is the, the midstream processing and the end process. And if you've got the three bits in a row um, or two of the bits in a row, um, you, you're sort of in a better position. If you've just got a hole in the ground or a plan for a hole in the ground, and nothing else, uh, avoid, um, if you're too isolated, avoid because, you know, um, it's not going to be viable to move you a large amount of material at a 1% grade a long way to somewhere else to get a process. Um, that is the problem. Yeah. All right. Well, well, we'll finish there. But that that was very, very insightful and very interesting. Um, so thank you again for coming on, Christopher. Um, and for those... I'll say it again for those who aren't familiar with Hall Garston Company. I'll leave a link in the description. They've got loads of research and also some of Rare Earth. So I'm sure there's a bit more information in there for those who are interested. Uh, Christopher, thanks again. Thank you very much.